We are talking about call this morning. We're going to read another call story. This one comes from Matthew's Gospel in the ninth chapter, beginning at verse 9. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he ate at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're talking about call. And I think this is probably, other than the week we had the dancers here, the first Sunday that I did not put on my vestments. Because when I was called, I was not called from the planet of the preachers and the ordained. But I'm guessing some of you remember this song from when you were kids. Sing it with me. I will make you fishers of men, fishers of men, fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. If you follow me, if you follow me. I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. I could have started with the call of the fishermen because everyone knows that story, right? Jesus sees them fishing and there are different versions of it. If he talks to Andrew first and Andrew goes and tells Peter or if he says go out and put the net down on the other side. And we, are, we love that story because we love that song. We know that one. And we like to think of the fishermen as these noble characters, poor people whose hearts belong to God, who are ready to drop everything and follow. But I didn't want to start there. I wanted to start with Matthew's gospel, the story of Levi being called, Levi who is called Matthew, because it's a little bit different, because Jesus is there with his merry band of fishermen, and they're walking along, and there is a tax table. Now, nobody likes taxes, right? How many of you, IRS, those letters put fear into my heart. <laughs> but we're not talking IRS. We're talking a different kind of tax collector. We're talking Matthew, also called Levi, who is himself a Jew. And for a Jew to collect taxes for Rome made him unclean and unloved because he was seen as colluding with the Roman Empire, that occupying force of heathens who had come into God's land to take over. I said it made him unclean because Roman money had a picture on it. Whose picture was on it? Abraham Lincoln? Yes. No. The Caesar with the inscription, Son of God. If you want to talk commandments, thou shalt not make a graven image, and you shall have no other God before me. So just carrying Roman coins would make you unclean. And if you're a tax collector collecting Roman coins and people hate you anyway, what are you probably going to do? You would skim a little bit off the top for yourself. You're going to charge more. You're going to be hated. If you're going to be hated, you might as well be hated and make some money at doing it. So Jesus is walking by with the disciples and he sees this tax collector and what does he say to him? He says, clean up your act, get a real job, learn the law of Moses, and then maybe you can follow me. That's what he said, right? That's what I just read? In case you're wondering, no. <laughs> Jesus says to this unclean, wretched, nasty man, follow me. Now, Matthew, I'm sure, was saying, me? You can't mean me. You're a righteous man. Why would you call me? Because Matthew knew very well who he was. But I don't want you to think about Matthew for a moment. I want you to think about the rest of the disciples. Because guess what? They were fishermen and they passed by all the time. And guess what happened when they passed by the tax table? The tax collector would say, you, Peter, you, Andrew, James, John, over here, money now. And do you think they liked that? 
So just imagine them going along saying, here we are, the Lord has called us. We must be very special people. We must be holier than most. And then Jesus is calling Matthew. I'm telling you now, I know human nature well enough to know that the fishermen wanted nothing to do with the tax collector. But they trust Jesus. And so they go with him. And he's having dinner. And who's he having dinner with? More tax collectors, more sinners. Draws the attention from the Pharisees. And what does Jesus say? People who are healthy don't need to go to the doctor, only those who need help. And then the line from this passage that has stayed with me through 35 years of ordained ministry and the years that came before, learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Well, I said we're going to talk about calling. The only way to really know me, and I had a feeling that some of you had probably taken a few Sundays off during the summer or all the Sundays off during the summer. Some of you I'm meeting for the first time today. Some of you are getting back into regular church attendance. The only way to really get to know me is to hear my story of call. So that's why I'm dressed like this this morning. And that's why the sermon's a little bit different. It's more of a testimony, really, than an expository sermon. Now, we read two passages from Jeremiah. And let me tell you why we picked those. But first, let me go back to 1981 or 82, when I started candidacy for ministry. The question they ask everyone is this. Out of all the stories of call in scripture, which one is more like yours? Let me ask you that. What are some of the stories of call before we even get into which one is yours? Tell me a story of someone who was called in scripture. Hmm? Mary. Mary, Mary the mother of our Lord, amen. Hmm? Moses. Moses. Samuel. Samuel, who else? Peter. Lots of stories of call, men and women called to a new life with their Savior, with their God in the Old Testament, with their Savior Jesus Christ in the New. And as I sat there and thought, the one that came most clearly to my mind was Sarai, wife of Abram, who later became Sarah, wife of Abraham, when they got a new identity in God. Sarah was called. She was told when she was getting up there in years, Post-menopausal Sarah was told, you are going to have a baby, and what did she do? She laughed. She laughed. God called me to the ordained ministry, and I'll tell you what I did. I laughed, because I thought God was pointing at somebody else, and I just happened to walk by. <laughs> now, through the years, I've come to learn that Sarah's call is not really my call. My call is Jeremiah. And we read two passages of Jeremiah that happened many years apart. The first, Jeremiah was called, and he was a teenager. Do we have any teenagers here today? <laughs> woo, woo, woo. Yeah, this is one of those passages where God calls you when you're just a kid. Now, I am a proud graduate of Cockeysville Elementary School. And I tell you, when I came here, it was the first time I ever put that on a resume, that I was a graduate of Cockeysville Elementary School, <laughs> also known as Warren Apartments for Senior Citizens, which I am now. And I've told everybody, if you drive by Cockeysville Elementary School, Warren Apartments for Senior Citizens, in the ball field, there is this huge tree. I could not put my arms around it if I tried. I helped to plant that tree. When the vice principal died, we planted a tree in her memory. And I drove by it one day, and I thought, how did it get to be so big? And then I did the math, and I understand. <laughs> but when I was in the fourth grade, Mrs. Athena Muno, good Greek lady from the Greek Orthodox Church, was my fourth grade teacher. She said to us all, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I replied boldly, I want to be the first woman bishop of the Methodist Church because in 1968 it was still the Methodist Church until later that year. And there weren't any women bishops in those days. But you know why I wanted to be a bishop? I had gone through confirmation at 10 years old, which is ridiculous. They don't do that anymore, thank God. But it worked. It sort of took. But I knew what a bishop did for a living. A bishop turned ordinary men, and in those days men, into pastors. 
they would kneel down in front of the bishop and he would put a hand, he would put a hand on their heads and they would turn into pastors, like a divine game of duck, duck, goose. Pastor, 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 pastor. I wanted to do that. I wanted to have the power to just look at people and say, you're a pastor and you're a pastor and you're a pastor and you're a pastor. Now, unfortunately, I was asked to tell that story once to a youth gathering and when we used to have youth assembly in the conference. Who walks in but Bishop Joseph Yakel, who had ordained me? He said to me later, was that when you were called to be a pastor? I said, oh no, that was when I was called to be a bishop. The pastor thing came much, much later. But I was called at a young age. And I graduated from college. And my friend Wayne, who was here the first Sunday, who is now a pastoral associate in the Roman Catholic Church, although he grew up Methodist, was the first person in college to say to me, you know you're going to be a pastor, just give up and go to seminary. And I said, are you out of your mind? Because that's what people said to me. If I voiced any thought of going into the ministry, people said, you can't do that. Very much like Mrs. Munoz had said to me, you can't do that because girls are not allowed to be bishops or priests. It took me years to find out that actually in the United Methodist Church, or the Methodist Church then, women had been accepted into full ministerial connection as itinerant pastors since 1956, which believe it or not was two years before I was born. But I didn't meet a woman pastor until I was in college at Towson, now Towson University, then Towson State University, a Lutheran pastor on campus. Also the first time I ever took communion with wine, which really opened my eyes. Ooh, I'm used to Welchade. But I spent three years trying to talk myself out of my call because I heard again and again and again, women are not allowed to do that. I heard other things too, like, you're just not like other pastors. You're a little too crazy to be a pastor. Bill, have you met a pastor who's not crazy? Yeah. You're not right. You're not holy enough. You're not learned enough. You're not this enough. You're not that enough. And so I decided against the call. And I tried desperately to do other things with my life. I tried so hard to find something else. But God did not let me go. When I was 22 years old, I was the head of the Pastor Parish Relations Committee at Frames Memorial United Methodist Church, also known as nobody else would take the job. And I was the lay member to annual conference. And it was in 1981 or 82 when I went to annual conference and I went to ordination. We were in Washington, D.C. that year. We had the sessions at American University. But we had ordination that year at the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception by Catholic University. And at the end of the ordination service, it still happens that an invitation goes out because, as I said, clergy come from the pews. They come from the laity. They come from the people of God and Jesus Christ. And the bishop said, is there anyone here who feels called to the life and work of an elder in Christ's church? Now, I had sat through the service, and when the bishop was asking the questions of the candidates for ordination, do you feel called to this life? And I was ordained in the olden days with the old these and thou's language. And the answer to the question was, so far as I know my own heart. And I found myself saying, yes, 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 yes. Didn't realize that at the end of the service, the bishop was going to say, among us are men and women who are called to this work. And if you're called, come forward. And I made the mistake of looking up, not at Bishop Fred Wirtz, but this was the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, a Roman Catholic congregation. And they have a crucifix larger than a human hanging at an angle, looking at the congregation. And I made the mistake of looking up and meeting the eyes of Jesus Christ, who said, yes, it's you. I want you. 
And I stood up. Now, the woman next to me grabbed my dress and said, where do you think you're going? Get back here. Have you lost your mind? And I was crying, and I was tripping over the pew, and I went to the front. And he still looked at me. And it was me he was looking at, not a man next to me, not another woman, not someone better suited. He looked at me. And I said yes. Now, I was crying so much, I gave them the wrong name. <laughs> because the Board of Ordained Ministries, right, they're going, what's your name, what's your name? We want to get your name while you're here. And I said Terry, and he got Terry down. He said, last name, Kofi Allen. And he was like, what? Spell that for me. And I said, C-O-F, and he wrote down B-O-F, and I said C-O-F, he wrote B-O-F, C-O-F. I said C-O-F-I-E-L-L, -L, and he wrote B-O-F, C-O-F, C-O-F-I-E-L-L. -L. Somehow they found Terry Boff Cough Coffeeel. But the next step, first I had to tell my parents, and they're here, and I don't know if they remember what they said. I told my parents, and so my mother said, you don't want to do that. People are mean to pastors sometimes. <laughs> I said, they might be, but this is what I have to do. And then you go to your congregation where they have a vote. Now, I was born into Epworth Church, baptized here, but when we were four or five, my family moved to Frames Memorial on the Texas Charge. The entire charge had to vote on me, and people who had known me since I was 10 years old, in a secret ballot, you need two-thirds of the group to say yes. Two-thirds said yes, but it was very close. There were people who said no, because I was a woman. And my heart was a little, little hurt. And a man came up to me, John Nash, not Bill's uncle John Nash, John Nash who has been with our Lord since 1992 now. But John Nash came up to me at the end of the meeting and he said, girl, I want to talk to you. Now you have to remember, this was back a long time ago when older men in the church really didn't have anything to do with teenagers or college students or right out of college. I don't think Mr. Nash had ever said anything to me before and he said, I need to talk to you. And he said, come out here with me. And we went outside and I was expecting him to say what I'd heard so many times before. God does not call women. What are you thinking? Now, usually it's God does not call women, followed by maybe God's calling you to marry a pastor. No. God does not call women, and this came from someone I had known all my life. Satan calls women to confound God's purposes. You are a servant of Satan. And the very first funeral I preached when I was 28 years old, the man who had died was 28. His wife was 26 pregnant with their first child. And they were both deaf. And as I prepared to preach the funeral, a man tapped me on the shoulder and said, you're an abomination in the eyes of God. I expected John Nash was going to say something similar to me. But John Nash said, 50 years ago, I was called to be a pastor. I knew that's what God wanted me to do with my life. But my family said, oh, John, you didn't even graduate from high school. How in the world are you going to get a GED and go to college and seminary? And someone said, oh, John, you stutter. How could you ever preach a sermon? And people said, John, you know that's not right. You shouldn't be doing something like that. And he looked at me and he said, girl, I'm telling you what, don't you ever, ever let anything come between you and what God wants you to do with your life. There's very few days that I don't think about John Nash. Well, called young like Jeremiah, but now I'm old like Jeremiah, because Jeremiah lived a long time and prophesied a long time. And if you see paintings of Jeremiah, I almost said pictures. Now, there are no photographs of Jeremiah that we know of. <laughs> But if you see paintings of Jeremiah, he's always bald in the pictures. We don't know that he had no hair, but do you know why he's painted as bald? Because he tore his hair out from frustration. The second passage we read is the one that resonates with me now. Because there are times, my mother was right, there are people who don't like pastors. Did you know that? There are people who can be mean to pastors, surprisingly enough. 
But Jeremiah was given a hard word to preach to people. Nobody wants to see a prophet coming, and I don't think anybody really wants to be a prophet. Jeremiah was given a word of warning to the people that their lack of faithfulness was going to end them up in exile, and in fact, they did. But as soon as the exile becomes a reality, what does he do? He goes out and he buys land at ground zero because he's proclaiming then that God will restore the people when they restore their faith. Jeremiah lived a long time, and he would get so frustrated sometimes he would say, Lord, I don't want to do this anymore. And there was a time in 1999 when I took a Sabbath rest and I flew to California because it was as far away as I could get without leaving the continental United States. And I walked the beach every day and prayed that God would take my call away because I was tired. I was exhausted. I was writing curriculum for the United Methodist Publishing House at night and being a pastor during the day. And I walked the beach every day in Pismo Beach, California, and I prayed, God, let me off the hook. Raise up somebody better than me, somebody more articulate, someone more right for this job than me. Now, everywhere I went in California, here, California's this godless, crazy place. Everywhere I went, people came up to me and said, I've seen you sitting on this bench. Would you like to come to church with me? And I'm like, not really. I went to church one Sunday and a woman said, you sing well, would you like to join our choir? And I see you don't have a wedding ring on, would you like to go to our singles group? They have people your age, because I was 40 when I went. And then I was walking down the beach saying, God, are you sure? Two little girls run out from a tent on the beach saying, our church is having services and we'd like you to come and grab me by the hand and start dragging me into the tent. And I look up and I said, all right, all right, all right, you're not done with me yet. But something has to change, God, because I'm becoming a ministry machine and I'm losing my joy. And I flew home to Maryland and I met my husband the next day. Be careful what you pray for. <laughs> I didn't pray for a husband, I just prayed for a change. Boy, did I get a change. Six foot four and a half inches of Southern Baptist. <laughs> I understand Jeremiah who says, I don't want to step on people's toes all the time. I don't want to challenge people. I don't want to shake people up. I don't want people mad at me all the time. I just want to be quiet and have a nice, normal life. But then there is a fire in my bones. And I still have it, 61 years old, three years a widow. I still have a fire for the Church of Jesus Christ, for my Lord and Savior. I can't do anything else with my life. I cannot do anything else with my life. I have tried. I can't do anything else with my life. You need to know that kind of stuff about me if we're going to be in ministry together. You also need to know about me that I know that you are all called, not to my ministry as an elder, not to Bill's ministry as a deacon, but I know you're called because you're in the building today. I know you're called because most of you have been baptized into the name of Jesus Christ, into his life, his death, his resurrection. I know that you have Christ in you because I have seen Christ in you. I've heard Christ in your music. I've seen Christ in your teaching. I've seen Christ in your commitment to mission and ministry. And together, this group of disciples can and will continue to do great things for God and our Savior. And some of you, some of you who are younger, and maybe some of you who are not so young, may find yourself being called to the life and work of a deacon or elder in Christ's church called the United Methodist Church. And if you hear the call, and you can answer, so far as I know my own heart, the answer is yes, then God will see you through. I've told some of you already that Bishop Joseph Hughes Yackel was the bishop who ordained me. And he puts the stole around your neck when you're an elder, and he pulls you up to his face. And I wanted so hard to hear what he was saying, but all I could hear was, 
it was like Charlie Brown with the teacher, wah, 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 wah. I was like, no, I've been waiting for this, because I saw him do that to everyone else. I had no idea what he said, and after ordination, we all said to each other, what did he say? And somebody said, my heart was beating so hard, all I could hear was my heart. But I have been blessed many times, including with young Bill Brown, who is not my son, to lay hands with the bishop at someone's ordination. It is a great honor. It is the greatest joy next to being ordained yourself. And I got to hear what the bishop said, and he said the same thing to everyone. God will never ask you to do what God will not equip you to do in Christ's name. And when I left my last congregation on my last Sunday, a man who rarely said anything out loud, a very quiet man, who had been quite ill in the years I was there, who wasn't able to come to church every Sunday because of a botched, very minor surgical procedure, was left with some cognitive issues and on a cane. But he hugged me his last Sunday, and he said, thank God for John Nash. I told you I'd tell everybody about John Nash. Let me tell you this. You may not be called to be a pastor. You may not be called to be a deacon. You may not be called to hold an office in the church. But maybe God is calling you to be somebody's John Nash. The one who encourages. The one who doesn't list all the reasons why it shouldn't happen. You might be the one to say to someone, if God is asking you to do this, go. Go with all your heart. But don't lose sight of Matthew. He was a tax collector. He had no business being with decent people. He was the least likely in the whole town. But Jesus saw something in him. Maybe it was his need for acceptance. Maybe it was his need for grace. Maybe it was his need for a fresh start. And just exactly where he was and how Jesus found him, he said, come and follow me. Nobody else understood that. But Jesus said, oh, if you could only learn, I desire mercy not sacrifice. I desire grace, not necessarily the law to the letter, but grace. I am here today because of the grace of God in Jesus Christ, not because I was a better Christian than anybody else on the block. I was in a singing group in high school and college. There were six of us who were always part of it, and those of you who were at Epworth on Cockeysville Road, when Bob Hurley didn't have a choir, sometimes he would call us to sing, and we would go over and sing. The six of us who were part of the core group one day listed who might go into the ministry. They didn't even put me on the list. But don't think that because you might be an unlikely candidate that God cannot use you in a powerful, powerful way. Whatever God calls you to do, I'm living proof, Bill's living proof, God will equip you to accomplish because God will never ask more of you than God will help you to achieve to the glory of our Savior Jesus Christ who calls us all.